Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Science North podcast's Give Vaccines a Shot, where we'll learn about the latest in vaccine news, about the global pandemic that we are facing, and also about our immune system. We will do this all through the lens of our expert guests. This month's guest is Dr. Tara Moriarty. Dr. Moriarty is the principal investigator at the Moriarty Lab. The Moriarty Lab is an infectious diseases research laboratory, which studies several fundamental mechanisms underlying blood-borne dissemination of bacterial pathogens. Here we go. So when I Google you or look you up on the internet, I get Tara or Dr. Moriarty um, at the University of Toronto with the Faculty of Dentistry, but you're the director of the Moriarty Lab, um, which studies infectious diseases and especially blood-borne um, bacterial pathogens. Uh, I might need a little bit of help in pronouncing this. So like Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. <laughs> or Der burgdorferi, yeah. yes, actually. That's really close. So how do you say it again? Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay, Borrelia burgdorferi, awesome. <laughs> Which is the causative <laughs> agent of, of Lyme disease. So can you give us a little bit of a background um, on your research and how you, you ended up in this field? Yes. Um, so first of all, I, I uh, just people are often confused. I'm cross appointed to dentistry and medicine. Um, and that's partly because um, uh, bloodborne infections are important um, for dentistry. And this is why uh, my appointment is in a dentistry faculty. Um, but I'm cross appointed to medicine because clearly I work uh, mainly Lyme disease is mainly a, a medical problem, um, not so much a dental problem that we know of. Um, so uh, I started working in this area. It's a circuitous story, but uh, when I was doing my PhD, I studied how um, cells age um, and how the, the telomeres, the, the ends of the DNA shorten as we age. And uh, I went to study Borrelia burgdorferi um, because it's an interesting bacterium that has both linear and circular DNA. So I first okay. wanted to study how it maintains linear DNA um, and then um, ended up uh, developing a system to um, film individual bacteria living in uh, live mice and moving through the bloodstream and, and through different parts of mice. So my research focus really shifted to trying to understand how these bacteria spread in the bloodstream. Um, and it's an important topic because we actually don't know how a lot of bacteria spread in the bloodstream. Um, it's a really under-researched area. So that is why I moved to that topic. That's really neat. Yeah. Uh, so we have we have linear DNA. That's like that's the comparison. Like, like yeah. our DNA is linear and then a lot of bacteria have them exactly. sort of in, a, in a circular way. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not that common for bacteria to have linear DNA, and Borrelia have this mixture, and it's really bizarre and interesting. So uh, initially, I just really wanted to understand um, how they were doing this, but I ended up moving on to uh, another topic, which happens in research. Something comes up, you realize that there's a big knowledge gap and that you can address it, and so you start addressing it. Which sort of brings me to my next question. So in the past couple of years, it seems you've been focusing um, on communicating about COVID-19. We had met last fall when we yeah. were talking um, yeah. about how to have sort of empathetic conversations about vaccination, about COVID-19. So how did you move into the area of COVID communication? Um, not, uh, you know, not intentionally. Uh, to begin with, uh, I had been on social media, on Twitter, um, before COVID, um, partly because uh, it's a really useful place for researchers. And I had been the, the primary caregiver for both of my parents who had dementia and couldn't go to conferences as much anymore um, and found Twitter actually very useful as a, as a research tool and for me to stay on top of what was happening in the, the world of, of you know, bloodborne infections and microbiology. Mm -hmm. um, but because I work on Lyme disease, there's a considerable amount of uh, misinformation about Lyme disease out there, and there's quite an urgent need to um, help uh, inform Canadians about uh, the risks of Lyme disease as it spreads further north. And um, so I was doing 
uh, increasingly more work that was about not talking with other scientists, but about talking with people. So coming into COVID, I had that experience. I have a bit of a thick skin as well that I developed from, uh, you know, I'm not uncomfortable on Twitter, which can sometimes be a, um, uh, uh, a conflict ridden place. Yeah. And uh, and I had spent a lot of time really thinking about about, uh, you know, people, uh, many people who um, Lyme disease is a difficult many people who um, have been um, who identify as having Lyme disease or may have been diagnosed with Lyme disease have had a really circuitous path um, to get to the point where they could get treatment. And that's not uncommon for um, uh, for chronic um, and for for chronic infections and chronic conditions. So yeah. I had also really started thinking a lot about what people need and about how scientists can serve those needs, um, as opposed to thinking about it the other way around. So when COVID came, there were such obvious enormous needs. Um, in so many different areas that uh, not just scientific um, that I started uh, trying to respond to those needs um, based on what uh, sort of the general public um, uh, needed and wanted um, as well as what, um, you know, my, my expert colleagues would think was important. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was just, there was an enormous need and someone had uh, like so many did, uh, you know, you had to act, you had to do something. And I have some really specialized skills that were useful. Yeah, it seems like a lot of scientists were able to sort of find their niche in the pandemic, even if it didn't necessarily directly relate to the research that they were doing. Your um, your conversation about um, people having trouble getting diagnosed for Lyme disease almost sort of parallels mm -hmm. what's happening right now with long COVID and people yeah. struggling with the continued um, symptoms of long COVID as well, too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, the, the, the themes or subjects of people um, uh, feeling um, sort of excluded or abandoned or not listened to or not recognized, the, these themes are the same. And they're the themes that are true for lots of people with disabilities. It's, it's, um, it's a common problem, and it's probably going to be quite a long lasting um, problem related to the COVID epidemic. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's a lot to be concerned about and work on. Um, so bringing it back to Lyme disease, could you describe to us what is Lyme disease? Yes. So Lyme disease is a disease that's caused by um, a spirochete bacterium and spirochetes, um, the, the Borrelia burgdorferi spirochete is a bit like a snake. It's a flat sine wave. And um, spirochetes generally are corkscrew or flat wave shaped bacteria that are very long. Um, they're quite unusual um, bacteria, although they're quite common. Um, and uh, the Lyme disease bacteria are transmitted to um, a wide range of vertebrate um, hosts by, uh, by ticks. And usually there's a quite a specific association between a species of um, uh, Lyme disease bacterium and the, the, the tick that can carry it. So the tick that uh, most commonly carries um, the Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme disease spirochete in North America are Ixodes ticks uh, or black-legged ticks or deer ticks. Okay. Um, and uh, it differs a little bit on the west part of the country and there are other uh, Borrelia species that cause Lyme disease. Um, but in general, when we talk about this, we talk about black legged ticks. And so then they're and, biting, sorry, the, sorry the, they're biting the deer <laughs> and then the deer has, or yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we'll, by my apologies, I skipped a whole chunk of uh, <laughs> stuff I should explain. <laughs> um, so these ticks carry bacteria, carry the bacteria and uh, they transmit them when they feed on any um, warm-blooded host, essentially. So the major animal reservoir that carries these bacteria on the east coast of North America are white-footed mice um, and probably um, chipmunks and other small animals because they account for a really uh, 
large um, sort of uh, biomass, um, and and they are responsible for carrying um, for carrying the bacteria that the ticks then pick up um, when they feed on those mice that are infected. They pick up the bacteria from the blood of the mice, and then they pass those bacteria on to the the next um, warm-blooded host that they feed on, um, whether that's a bird or a mammal. And people are, um, uh, you know, we're not a, a normal part of the zoonotic cycle. We're we're right. accidental hosts, um, but we can be bitten just like others. Um, and deer. Uh, yes, they may be important. Um, they're certainly important, for example, in Manitoba and Central Canada and probably Atlantic Canada because they they help carry ticks um, further north um, into Canada from the U.S. Um, they're important for that reason. Um, there tend to be more adult ticks on deer and, and they mate there and and um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, molt um, and, uh, uh, you know, drop off. And, and uh, so, so deer are a major blood source for adult ticks. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the major reservoir is likely small rodents in, north, in the east coast of North America. And so were the, are the rodents affected by the bacteria or are they managed to live, sort of, I guess, symbiotically with the, with the, with the bacteria? That's, that's a, Really, really good question. A very interesting question. So, um, it does not appear that wild mice um, develop symptoms in response to the bacteria. So they be able, they seem to be able to carry them asymptomatically. There is some question about whether the presence of the bacteria might um, alter their um, their their viability or reproductive viability compared to other species. Uh, there, there's no um, you know, substantial evidence to support that because white-footed mice have actually really been expanding their range in North America, and that's partly why Lyme disease is spreading. Um, so, um, but there's no, there doesn't appear to be any clear disease effect um, in wild mice. However, laboratory mice, certain strains of laboratory mice that have been uh, bred in different ways. Some of them are more susceptible to infections and they're used as animal models of human infection. And there are several strains of laboratory mice that are um, susceptible to uh, developing arthritis, for example, and carditis um, in response to the bacteria that cause Lyme disease, unlike um, wild um, white-footed mice, for example. So there are um, differences even within species, um, there are considerable differences in susceptibility by, you know, the strain of animal that's involved. They may just carry the bacteria or they may carry the bacteria and develop disease. What, what makes it so difficult for us to diagnose Lyme disease in people? Um, well, you know, it's, it's a problem for many infectious diseases. So a lot of infectious disease testing um, depends on de detecting antibodies to the infectious agent in the blood. Um, the problem is that antibodies to infectious agents take time to develop. Um, and, and so like many other pathogens, it takes a while um, before people develop antibodies to the bacteria that cause Lyme disease. And this means that um, early in infection, when, when it's most important for people to get antibiotic treatment, um, it's quite likely that tests will be negative. Um, the other thing is that these bacteria affect the, um, the maturation of what are called germinal centers. So these are where uh, white blood cells that produce antibodies um, uh, mature, develop and mature um, okay. and um, proliferate. And so Borrelia is known to affect the maturation of these centers and may disrupt production of antibodies to itself. Um, so there's also a reason to think that, yeah, we're more, we're less likely to develop antibodies to, uh, to Borrelia than maybe to some other pathogens. Um, and so that's another reason why, um, there may be challenges with testing, especially early in infection, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when you really want to start antibiotic treatment. 
later in infection, um, it appears that there, you know, there is a fairly strong antibody response. There's not too much concern about testing sensitivity later in infection. Um, but it's that early stage when you really want to get your antibiotic treatment that the tests aren't that sensitive. This is not a problem that's unique to Lyme disease. It's unique. It's common for many infectious diseases. And for example, if you look at HIV, it took mm -hmm. um, decades and, and, you know, billions of dollars of research to develop rapid tests for HIV. Um, and it requires considerable investment and a lot of time to, to do that work. Well, so we were, they had on the news a couple of weeks ago, they were talking with the university, with researchers at the University of Guelph, and they're looking at trying to come up yeah. with a, 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 a different type of test. I, I, I assume would be testing for the pathogen instead of testing for the antibodies. Is that, is that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, the, the challenge is that, um, Borrelia, when they infected the Lyme disease bacteria, there are very, very few of them in our bodies um, compared to a lot of other bacteria that cause infections. Mm -hmm. So direct testing for the presence of the bacterium has been um, really challenging. And for example, PCR-based tests are um, uh, notoriously um, insensitive or subject to uh, false positives. They're really, really challenging to work with. And I say this as someone who, you know, in our lab with mice, uh, we do PCR testing all the time. But so PCR testing has really been a problem. Um, and, and despite, uh, you know, decades of effort, it hasn't really uh, panned out all that well, although they're always, it's always possible to have new developments. Um, and there are other methods that you might be able to use, but so far the most sensitive method that we have that's also reliable um, has been this uh, serology or antibody-based testing. There are other ways that it's been improved so that it's more sensitive and faster and less subject to um, judgment um, than the, the current tests and the way they're done. And uh, you know, detection of early infection has probably improved by about 30% over the last few years. And that's really a, a significant gain. Mm -hmm. um, but we still are missing a fair number of early infections. And we're also missing a lot of early infections are not starting treatment simply because um, we need to ensure that people and healthcare providers are really familiar with what Lyme disease looks like when it starts. Um, so that they know to go and get tested or start treatments or, or get uh, prophylactic treatment, for example. And that's a really big challenge. As we can see from COVID, it's really hard to ensure that complete accurate information gets out to as many people as possible, um, as fast as possible. And in Canada, as Lyme disease is spreading further north, this is a real challenge because it's still new for a lot of people and um, there will be a lot of cases that are missed for that reason because it's not an everyday part of what we think about when we're outside in many parts of Canada mm -hmm. and we haven't really made that transition um, in uh, you know most of the southern part of the country so it's 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 a compound problem it's not just about the science it's about everything else it's about education and, and making sure people are aware yeah. of it, which is, I guess, so we're, we're, we're yeah. wrapping up May right now. Um, this is going to be broadcast a little yeah. bit later, but May is, is yeah. Lyme Disease Awareness Month. I mean, I grew up in Manitoba, and we were fairly tick aware in Manitoba. Um, yeah. Is the reason yeah. why it's moving sort of into southern parts of Canada because of climate change? Is like, is that what's happening? Like the, or the, you were saying that it's the, the, the territory of the mice is sort of moving northward? Yeah, so, um, you know, there are complex things going on, but in short, yes. So the the territory of the, the mice, which are the main vector, is expanding northward. Um, as these mice, and it's they're not always the vector in all places, but that is part of what, for example, is um, carrying it, um, especially in... in um, Canada east of Manitoba, a lot of that is, is um, there are a lot of white-footed mice. Um, there's also, um, you know, that the, the 
the range in which the ticks can survive the winter and the summer is expanding as well. So we're also just becoming, our climate is becoming more hospitable mm -hmm. um, for the ticks themselves in many parts of Canada. So they tend to, they tend to like um, warmer, um, more humid conditions. Um, they often will survive in leaf litter or on deer, for example, in the winter. Um, but, um, but as our climate warms and humidifies in some parts of the country too, um, we, we are seeing ticks expanding northward. And once the ticks expand northward, um, it's only a year or two before we start seeing the bacteria that cause Lyme disease spreading within that tick population. So it's often that you see the mice moving, the ticks moving, and then a couple of years later, there are, um, uh, you know, there, there's there are considerably more Lyme disease bacteria in the ticks. Right, so, and then increased cases of Lyme know, disease. Yeah, exactly. So parts of Southern Ontario that were, that were sporadic for Lyme disease before, big chunks of Southern Ontario are uh, effectively endemic now which means that at least 20% of all the ticks are carrying Lyme disease bacteria. Wow. That's true in Southern Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Southern Quebec. Um, and um, it's, uh, there's, there's also Lyme disease um, on Vancouver Island, for example. So it's a growing problem. And um, the spread of Lyme disease has perfectly matched what was expected um, and predicted now uh, you know, going back nearly 10 years ago, based on the um, expansion of the habitat range of, of um, ticks and, and mm -hmm. mice. And, uh, you know, 80% of the Canadian population now lives in, in prime tick habitat. Um, and uh, it's likely that in many regions, uh, Lyme disease um, is or will be endemic fairly soon. So one of the things we can do, I guess, is just to make sure that we're aware of ticks. Um, but also, yeah. is there, so we have, at Science North, we got funding from um, Public Health Agency of Canada to help increase uh, vaccine awareness. We're not just focusing yeah. on COVID-19 vaccines. We are hoping to expand to other yeah. things. And is there, yeah. a, is there a vaccine um, against Lyme disease, or are they developing a vaccine against Lyme disease? Yes, well, there's a vaccine for dogs. So uh, our dogs are vaccinated against Lyme disease. Um, there was a Lyme disease vaccine um, that was actually very effective. Um, but it was, it, um, th it was uh, I guess, an early victim of vaccine misinformation. There were a lot of sensational side effects that were reported. Um, and, you know, with investigation, it was found that these side effects were no more common in vaccinated people than unvaccinated people. Um, mm -hmm. That, as you can see from the way uh, misinformation about COVID vaccines has spread, um, that, um, it, you know, having that knowledge is not enough to um, dispel people's fears. Um, so eventually what happened was that the Lyme disease vaccine was just taken off the market because it wasn't, there was no point, there was no uh, commercial demand for it or not enough to be able to uh, cover the costs of it. Um, so there's a new vaccine, well it's not new, it's been in development and trials for quite a while now, um, that um, can target not just the, the major species of uh, bacteria that cause Lyme disease in North America, but also in Europe, because there are different strains and species. Okay. Um, so it's a sort of a multivalent vaccine that targets um, a, a wide range of bacteria. And um, it's going into um, phase three clinical trials now. The, the safety and efficacy data so far have been excellent. Um, and they're starting the, you know, the major trials to um, to determine on a larger population to determine its effectiveness or uh, efficacy, I guess, because it's a trial. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's still going to be a while before we'll know the results for that. It's not like COVID, you know, there, there's not as much money and, you know, to do this work. Um, but uh, hopefully within a couple of years, we will have uh, those data and we may have a Lyme disease vaccine that's available to us. 
With, and it would probably be administered similar to how maybe rabies is administered, sort of like higher risk people maybe would get it ahead of time, would, would you think, or? Um, no, uh, no, there's no reason to think that. It should be available to the general population. Um, you know, it's not going to be, uh, it'll start with adults first, you know, all the usual things with vaccines, right, where they're tested adults first and then, mm -hmm and then uh, kids going down by age, um, but it'll initially be available to adults and it's likely that it would be available to um, um, anyone who would seek it out or need it because of exposure risks. Um, and uh, you know, that depends, right? So, you know, your exposure risk, if you uh, live in a rural area, work in a rural area, especially um, are in tick habitat all the time are fairly high, but, you know, um, for quite a number of years when we were living in Toronto, we were living down by the down by the water and um, we took uh, our dogs down to the beach all the time and uh, to the dog park there and otherwise just in our backyard. And we pulled a number of ticks off them um, over time, um, but um, actually one of them contracted Lyme disease. Um, from one of those ticks and that's in a really urbanized that's just from going to you know the park the dog park mm -hmm. um, down by the water so uh, it doesn't mean that people who live in urban areas wouldn't be exposed um, wherever there's sort of microhabitat that uh, could be good for ticks or at you know lake shores for example where uh, migrating birds might drop ticks um, after coming over the water um, is is a um, uh, potentially a, a problem and, and you know there are endemic parts of the city of Toronto and of other uh, major cities um, that have endemic Lyme disease so I think people in general who go um, into uh, parks I guess and potentially I guess or outside <laughs> exactly I think that we're going to find out I think we're going to have to think about who's going to want to get this. Um, but um, I would say, you know, if a vaccine becomes available, I'm going to get it immediately. Um, mm -hmm. I know what Lyme disease can do. And I certainly would like to have protection as long as the vaccine is, you know, found to be effective and safe. Is, is uh, the antibiotic treatment fairly, um, like, is, does it work fairly well if it's treated initially? I mean, if you if you get bit by a tick, do you think that the best idea is just to go to your health professional and say, like, I got bit by a tick well, and show them the tick and then say, please put me on some antibiotics? Yeah, so actually, uh, you're supposed to do that. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about this. And there's a lot of confusion among healthcare providers about this. If people live or have been in um, an endemic area, which means that 20% of the, the ticks there are carrying the bacteria that cause Lyme disease, um, and if they find a feeding tick on themselves, um, so not, you know, maybe, uh, so ticks start out kind of poppy seed sized, very small, mm -hmm. and then they get uh, really, shockingly large and engorged with the blood as they feed and i've seen this on our dogs and it's pretty uh it's pretty gross um and so if you find a feeding tick so a tick that is is growing um that is attached to you and you've been in an area where 20 percent of the, the ticks are infected then uh, you need to uh, see a physician um, right away and get prophylactic antibiotics. So the physician will remove the tick and give you um, one or two doses of antibiotics that will help to prevent the chance of tr transmission if the, um, uh, if the tick is carrying the bacteria. It's not perfect, and you certainly don't want to have a two-week course of antibiotics because right. it's not warranted. It's not good for antibiotic resistance. Prophylaxis isn't perfect, um, and it's important for people to know that, but it does reduce um, the, the chance of infection quite a bit. Um, and then people should monitor for uh, the development of a bullseye rash at the tick bite site, and this is a, a large sort of four to five centimeter rash that is red around the ring and, and um, not red inside. Um, mm -hmm. And this is very hard to see on people with darker skin. 
um, people should monitor for that. And uh, they may end up being uh, tested um, later if they have symptoms, but it's also important to know that testing, if it's done too early, will be negative um, because there hasn't been time to develop an antibody response. So that the timing of testing has to be, you have to wait to do the testing um, because it's not informative before a certain point. So there are some pretty simple things that people can and should do and that healthcare providers can and should do. Um, but there's a fair bit of confusion about it. And also there's there's really not an awareness of, of how widespread um, uh, the, the carriage of Lyme disease bacteria is by ticks in big mm -hmm. parts of the country where most of the Canadian population lives. Um, so a lot of it's a communication problem. And then I guess if you make sure once you've gone out and you do a tick check um, and you find a tick possibly feeding on you, yeah. the, the quicker and I mean, pulling out as straight up yes. so that it doesn't leave its body parts in you. But if you do that almost immediately yeah. after coming back, that'll probably reduce your chances of infection as well. Yes. Too. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you want to save the tick. And there are a lot of ticks that, um, you know, don't transmit Lyme disease. So there are dog ticks, for example, uh, deer ticks. Um, so just because it's a tick doesn't necessarily mean that it can carry Lyme disease, although there are other pathogens that ticks carry. Um, but yes, you should remove it right away. And uh, there are other things that you should do when you're out of doors. Um, uh, the first thing, which is very hard to do in lovely weather, um, especially if it's warm, is to wear pants tucked into socks. Um, and this is because ticks typically land on people. Um, they sort of, what they do something called questing. So they climb up leaves of grass usually, or, or some plants. Um, and they, they sort of sit at the top and they fall onto or drop off onto um, uh, a, an animal or a person who brushes past or who walks underneath them. And uh, that's how they end up, um, that's typically how they end up um, on people or if you're lying down in the grass or something like that. Mm -hmm. Once they uh, land on you, they crawl very, very slowly um, to a spot on your body, usually that's a bit warm and damp because um, it's a good spot for them to feed. So that can be your hairline, your groin, your armpit. Um, you can get tick bites in hard to see places. So the reason that putting uh, your pants into socks is helpful is because um, it prevents them from, or it makes it harder for them to climb up your body from your feet, which is or your legs, which is where you're most likely, they're most likely to drop onto. Mm -hmm. um, um, but other things that you can do if that's not possible are um, for sure when you come in from out of doors, uh, shower, um, that may help wash off any ticks that haven't yet firmly attached. Um, you can also throw your clothes into um, the dryer um, on a hot cycle. Um, you don't have to wash them, you just have to put them in the dryer and that um, can t kill ticks that are present. Um, okay. You can do things like that, do tick checks, make sure you don't have any on you. Um, and uh, it's often helpful to have someone else look as well, do a quick check. So parents check your kids, partners check each other. Um, none of these are perfect, but if you do all of these things and are aware, um, they will reduce your chances of picking up Lyme disease from these ticks. And the other thing, sorry, is that you should stay, if you're out you know, in, in the woods or if you're out walking, stay at the center of trails. Um, don't go off into the, the sides, um, into brushy areas, because you could you can have lots of ticks that are are you know just sitting on grasses or leaves uh, waiting for something to come along to feed on. Um, so if you do things like stick to the center of trails and cleared areas, you're less likely um, to come into contact with with a tick. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for all of this um, great information about yes. ticks and Lyme disease. Uh, before we leave, yeah. just two questions. So what's the greatest challenge in your field of work? Um, oh, well, uh, that's a, well, that's a hard question. I mean, scientifically, there are um, loads of challenges. Um, I think 
you know, one of the things I actually think about a lot now is is how you get scientific advances like vaccines or anything else um, that are that can really change uh, and protect a lot of or they can protect a lot of people from disease, mm -hmm. how you actually implement them away in a way. So I think we've seen this with the COVID vaccine. You can develop something that is um, that is um, highly effective. We know that it's less effective against Omicron, but we got Omicron partly because we let so many infections spread all over the world. Um, and I think one of the major barriers um, to saving lives and protecting people from illness and COVID has been uh, the human element and not so much the, the, the scientific advance yeah. or invention. And I think that's true for Lyme disease too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some really simple, straightforward things you can do that don't provide perfect protection, but that combined provide a significant amount of protection um, from picking up Lyme disease. And we need to know that we need to ensure that everyone knows what to do, um, when to do it, how to do it, and just does it routinely without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's actually one of our biggest challenges with Lyme disease. And then finally, what is your favorite thing about your work? <laughs> that is a really general question. I don't know how to answer it. It depends. Do you know what? My absolute favorite thing in the world is data analysis. So, <laughs> so awesome, though. I've, I've, <laughs> I know over time I am I'm quite a nerd like I love a problem I love something that's tough to solve that you have to sort of think and think and think and figure it out I love that sense of achievement um, and by nature that's that's who I am and what I most like to do it and that's do and that's probably why I'm a scientist right because I love mm -hmm. that type of work but over time um, I have learned that I think that I've developed um, a great appreciation for um, how important um, a scientist serving their community can be. Um, so, and the, uh, the, the gratification and the fundamental importance of providing that as a service to people. Um, so, you know, extending or sharing the skills that you have and the training that you have and making it available to people who don't have the same training or skills is something that, um, especially in COVID, I've really grown to uh, believe is is extraordinarily important. And and I guess I do love it too. It's it's mm -hmm. um, it's rewarding and interesting, and and it's an entirely different problem, I guess. Um, but it's so important as a human being to do work like that. And, and, um, and I quite love that because, um, uh, you know, I can work on my puzzles and the things that fascinate me and that I'm trying to solve and it's crucial that I do it. But, um, at the same time, there are immediate, uh, simple ways that I can provide support to people and it's, um, it feels good as a human being to do that. Helping out others. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah, for spending time with us. And um, your expertise was greatly appreciated. And I yeah. really appreciate the time that you spent with us. Of course, I'm, I'm, so, uh, I'm so glad to do it. And I'm so grateful for the invitation as well. Thank you so much for listening. We want to know what questions you have. If you have any questions about this episode or vaccines in general, please send them to vaccines at sciencenorth.ca. If you want to find out more, please visit our website, sciencenorth.ca slash give vaccines a shot. Also, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Lastly, Give Vaccines a Shot is funded through financial contribution from the public Health Agency of Canada. Views expressed herein do not necessarily reflect the views of the Public Health Agency of Canada.